I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're taking a deep dive into a provocative and enlightening book. It is called American Elementary Education, The Longest Pandemic. It's written by Dr. Patrick Dalabata, one of our favorite guests here on Spotlight TV. He's also penned another wonderful book. It's called The Adventures of Thomas in Hopi Land. To his book on American education, this work critically examines the state of American elementary education, highlighting the challenges and shortcomings in kindergarten through sixth grade as compared to international standards. We're delighted to welcome back this talented author. We thank the team at Atticus Publishing for helping us put him in the spotlight today. We ask viewers like you to support writers like him by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing his wonderful books. The links are below the interview. Great to see you today, Doctor. Thanks for joining us. No, oh, thank you for having me. Let's start out with your brand new book, The Adventures of Thomas in Hopi Land. Tell us what that's all about. Well, you know, as a school superintendent and principal, I was always asked to uh, come in and read to children. And it was kind of hard because I, I didn't know what book to choose. And I came across a book called Field Mouse Goes to War, which is a public domain book uh, written by Edward Kennard in the in the 30s, back in the 30s. And I thought it was such a cute story that, and and I've uh, collected Hopi uh, kachinas and I happen to have a couple of the warrior mouse kachinas. So um, I read the story to the children and always thought, hey, this is such a great story, but it could be expanded a bit. And so uh, I walk every morning and when I walk, I kind of think about things. And I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to, since this is public domain, I'm going to go ahead and write a better story using the same theme of the story. And that's what started. So I wrote a book, a children's book called Thomas and the Warrior Mouse. Then I expanded it into Thomas and the Chutiva Snake Dance, which is still at the publishers getting ready. Mm -hmm. Well, walking one morning, I thought, geez, you know, book books are kind of neat, I think, and kids love them. I'm going to write a transition to put the books together into one long book, mm. Thomas and the Adventures of Thomas in uh, Hopi Land. And that's exactly what I did. And it has been uh, very, very successful in terms of uh, the, the, thing, the interactions I've had with children. And I think it's going to be a great book for the, for the market. Absolutely. Tell us what Hopi Land is and what the overall theme of the book is. Okay, the theme uses the, the Hopi uh, Native American. Uh, it occurs in the reservation. The Hopi Reservation is located in northern Arizona, and it's completely surrounded by the Navajo Reservation. The Hopi Reservation is very small. There's probably only about 13,000, 14,000 Hopis on the reservation, but it occurs on the reservation. And the thing they didn't interested me about the Hopis, uh, they are a very peaceful, intelligent, hardworking group of people. And uh, that inspired me. And I think the book was so cute. I just I just couldn't get away with it. And so I just decided, hey, I'm going to put all this together and see what happens. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure the reaction has been great because it's a great looking book. Uh, it's a great reading book. And I think it is a great contribution to the uh, literary choices out there for young students in America today, which kind of brings me to your next book, American Elementary Education, The Longest Pandemic. You've written a children's book now. It seems like perhaps one of the biggest problems in education today is the move away from the fundamentals. We used to call it reading, writing, and arithmetic, the three R's. Um, and there's been a shift from that. Is that one of the problems with American education today? Absolutely. We have uh, given up on the things that worked in education and tried all kinds of new things, none of which work. And I think, you know, there's been a turnaround in education just re recently. Uh, as far as I know, there are 32 states that are mandating from legislatively uh, change in the way we teach reading in particular and writing. And people are just now realizing that reading is so important. It's a phonetic English is a phonetic language, and we need to learn using a phonics approach. And that reading is so tied to writing that they need to go together. And I think um, 
most of the, the, the changes in America will occur slowly over the next few years, but unfortunately it has to be a top-down top down change and it's because it's not happening for the most part within the educational system itself. It's almost mind boggling that one of the top universities in the world, Columbia University, is the teacher's college that actually moved away from phonics. They thought that phonics was passe and were teaching another type of reading to children that was not nearly as effective. Um, that's a major flaw. It's been finally acknowledged by the university. They've backtracked and they're going to add phonics back into their curriculum. But that's the kind of quote unquote progressive thinking that kind of undoes the things that people intrinsically and intuitively know, right? That's correct. And, and the sad part is that our students have been losing, you know, in terms of performance for many, many years. Uh, some of our our states aren't doing as well as third world countries in terms of uh, education of the children. And that's sad because we used to have the best educational system in the world. Now, there are bright spots, and I'm very, very hopeful that those bright spots will kind of encourage others to uh, to perform better. Is the digital world a friend or a foe? Uh, you've got a lot of access to every book in the world can now be kept on your phone, which is wonderful. Um, every book in the world virtually can be read to you, which is helpful for people who perhaps have um, learning disabilities. But this is also a distraction and has shortened our attention spans. So what's your uh, take on the digital age of education in 2024? Well, I think the computer technology is, is great if used properly. Um, I think maybe as, as students get older, it's it's a tremendous source of information. It, it can be used in a very effective way to help kids uh, provide them with information, with options to read, et cetera, et cetera. However, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing uh, teachers forcing children to use computer tablets in first grade, second grade, third grade. And you know, it makes me sad when I go to the store and I see uh, a parents uh, shopping with their children and, and, a sh and the children in a shopping cart fixed to a, either a tablet or a phone. That makes me very, very sad because that's not what how children learn. We've got auditory, we've got visual, we've got kinesthetic, and those are the things, all three are important if children are to learn properly, especially when it comes to uh, learning the English language. And especially when it comes to the AI that has now crept its way into our uh, our universe, our digital universe, it corrects your spelling. It makes suggestions for sentence structure, um, you know, tense and so forth. So they are being corrected. I know myself, I think I'm a not a great speller anymore because I just type whatever is close and just autocorrect it, you know, just because it's quicker. Um, but at least at one point, I learned I before E except after C and all the other little rules that we learned in school. Kids today aren't learning like that. They can type anything and then just, you know, click fix this on their uh, Google, right? Right. But the sad part is when you take a first grader that, that doesn't have the capacity to, to, to type, uh, they're spending a lot of, wasting a lot of time typing with one finger mm -hmm. and... You know, that's just a waste of instruction. One of the problems we have in education today is the amount of wasted instruction. Um, if you look at some of the schedules from early America, uh, when there were a lot of one-room schools, every minute of time is absolutely taken up per perfectly. Nothing is wasted. And we waste too much time in elementary levels in school now nowadays. So uh, the better schools are those schools that are using instruction time wisely and, and cherishing every minute they have to teach. That's Absolutely. important. One of the distractions that you mention in uh, your book is the fact that teachers unions sometimes get in the way. What are your thought on teachers unions and the controversies that have arisen lately, such as critical race theory and so forth? Well, critical race theory, gender 
dysphoria identification. Those things are driving me absolutely nuts. Okay, uh, I, I see on TV where some drag queens are reading books to, to first and second graders and third graders. And that's the absolute worst thing we could do to children. That is just absolutely abhorrence to, to what is good in life and good in education. So I think we need to concentrate, forget all the, the liberal crazy ideas that we have, get back to the basics, teach children effectively according to what research tells us, and, and you know, don't waste any time. And those subjects are, are something that can be dealt with by parents. And I'm so glad that, that, that at least critical race theory, gender identification, et cetera, those are the issues that have gotten parents more involved in schools, and that is going to change schools, the parental involvement. Particularly in higher education, it's just obsessed with gender theory. I got my master's degree as an adult, and I would tell you, 70 to 80 percent of my curriculum was about gender, that gender is a spectrum, that it's a social construct. And class after class after class, no matter what it was about, all devolved down to discussions about gender. Um, in many ways, higher education has been hijacked. And that filters down to the elementary school because, you know, I was studying education and, you know, I, that wasn't helping me or my students become, you know, better learners. Right. And, and speaking of technology, there's not a pro 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 professor or a teacher in the world that can't go on the internet and figure out what is the most effective way to do things. Okay, there's so much research that supports uh, teaching using phonics and the phonics approach in, in reading instruction. Uh, writing, we've almost totally abandoned, many schools have totally abandoned the ability to print and write. Mm. Uh, I have a grandson, he's a great student and everything else, but he has a tough time reading my notes to him that are written in script. Mm. And that just that just makes me sad. Yeah. And a lot of it also has to do with like training, discipline, and, you know, structuring your brain for in further studies. I mean, there's some importance in learning cursive. Um, it might not make sense to a second grader, but it was part of you know, the training of children to have a classic education. The same thing is true with studying foreign languages, classic languages, and so forth, world history. Um, it can't all just boil down to sociology and psychology and what's happening right now. Correct. Correct. Um, and the sad part is that, that a lot of our college professors um, weren't used to what was good. They were taught improperly. They taught improperly, and now they're principals and administrators um, supporting things that don't work, that just don't work. So I think there's a there's a lot of uh, concentration on how our children perform, and I think that competition um, is going to encourage a lot of schools that aren't effective to do better. I mean, every state publishes the performance the, of all the schools in their in their state mm -hmm. and all parents need to do is go to the internet figure out what schools are doing the job and that allows them to choose possibly a better place to send their children and this this i think i think we, we're about to turn around education in america i hope i think it's going to take a while but i think i think we're going in the right direction at least what gives you that hope? What are you seeing? What kind of change? Um, is it among the parents? Is it among the teachers? Tell us a little bit more about how you think, think things can improve going forward, what parents can do, what teachers can do. Let's talk about solutions a little bit. Okay. I, I think it started with parents over the issues of, of critical race theory and stuff. Um, and, and parents got very active with school boards. And then, of course, in the news, you heard about, oh, these are domestic terrorists, these parents, and blah, blah, blah. Well, they're the ones they are going to force the change. They've gotten involved. And even though those are subjects that are just ridiculous, in my opinion, now they're getting a little bit more involved in the actual instructional process that we use in our schools. And that is going to help change. So legislatively, we're getting more parents interested in, in government and in running 
and in, in assuming positions of leadership that can help, help make those changes. So I think, I think that's a good thing. And I think for that reason, I think in the next few years, I hope that we will begin to see a little bit better performance in, in our schools. Wonderful. Tell us a little bit about the case study from Arizona's successful elementary program. It's a big part of your book. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, many years ago, I had the absolute privilege of building a school, actually building a school, and the school board was uh, not happy with the performance of the children in the district. And they asked me to, to put in an effective instructional program. We did that. We went back to the basics. We taught uh, phonics, we taught reading, we taught geography, we taught history, we did things. In fact, the most amazing thing was for me, we, we believed uh, in national, being a, a good patriotic citizen. Mm -hmm. So the first day of school, this new school, we had the children in front of the flag, in front of the school, and we said the Pledge of Allegiance, and we had... 20 or 30 calls from parents saying, hey, what's wrong? Is there an emergency at school? Or, and this is crazy. I mean, yeah. this just is crazy. Well, at the end of the year, that school not only did well, they were among the highest performing schools in the state of Arizona and nation. Yeah. And at one time, we were even accused of cheating on these performance tests. You know, the state required a performance test. So my, my, I, I told the school superintendent, the state school superintendent, well, come on down, no notice, don't give me any, any warning, any day you want to come down, you can test any grade you want in this school, and then see if, see if what we've, that we've, quote, not done the right thing by uh, administering the test. So sure enough, they took us up, gave us 15 minutes warning, they tested the children in the school, and guess what? They did even better than the first time they took the test. Yeah. Now this is, they were incredible. They said, this is unbelievable. We've never seen a school make such a change so quickly. So come on down and tell us, come to the state and tell us what you've done. We did that. We explained it to them. Uh, change in state school superintendent. Next person came in and it slowly Lee went back to mediocrity. And so that was, that's what was sad. Yeah. You know, we had a beautiful situation and that school is now one of the worst schools in the, in the, in the area that I, that I'm in. Amazing. That's Amazing that somebody would take good work and undo that good work, particularly when you have proven results. Um, and it makes you scratch your head sometimes as to what the motivation is. Something that makes me scratch my head is the fact that so many teachers unions and some school districts push against standardized testing. I don't know how you have a gauge for how well students are doing unless you do have standardized tests. What are your thoughts on the subject? I think it's absolutely essential. Um, I think it, it parents need to know where their children stand. Um, I think, I, I wish that things were a little bit more uh, common between states but nonetheless in this state they are tested there's all kinds of, of uh, issues that and they create grades for schools based on their performance and if i were a school principal i'd be looking at the schools that are doing the best and i'd, I'd try and figure out hey what are you doing that i'm not doing that makes your kids perform so well okay so i think it's absolutely essential that children are tested and they know what's happening and in fact I'm writing a another a follow-up book, okay, for parents only. Nothing, not written in a more professional journal type way, but just, hey, these are my recommendations. When you go send your children to school, look at the school and make sure these things happen. Okay. And that, and so I don't know, that might be available sometime. I in between children's books and everything else, I get I go back back to it. And and I think it's gonna be simple. This is what you need to see happen. This is how you can assure that things happen the right way. And, and hopefully that will uh, help parents perform or yeah. get their children in schools that perform. Yeah, parents are really the key uh, for success for children in, uh, in, in, in school and in life, actually. 
You know, if you've got a parent who's motivated with the child, who reads to the child, who talks to the child, who does homework with the child, that child is going to excel. Uh, do you agree? Absolutely. The, those children enjoyed school. Um, I, sometimes we underestimate children. I, it, you know, when they first learn to read, I mean, it's like the light goes on. Mm -hmm. And as a teacher, I enjoyed that more than anything. All of a sudden, they know that they can read. And they can take uh, texts that they haven't read before and phonetically address things, and, and they can actually read. And it's like a light going on. Yeah. Well, I, want, I saw it in my own children who are doing very, very well. Uh, my grandchildren are doing very, very well. And, and you know, it's it's so important that that parents understand that kids love to achieve. They love school. They want to do well in school for the most part. Mm -hmm. And 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 you know, but it all originates from parents. I mean, if parents make sure their children understand that education is important, how you perform is important, then you're going to be a winner. Exactly. Got to get there on time. You have to do what, what you're told. You have to attend school regularly. I mean, there are some basics that parents have to do to ensure success because when a child misses school, they fall behind. When they're not doing well, they get caught up into a, a cycle of failure as well. That's been my observation. Let's talk about another aspect of your book, historical context. Tell us a little bit about why you think understanding the history of American, uh, American history rather helps education. Well, I think I think it's important that we understand children understands that we live in a great, great country, perhaps the greatest country in the world. We have our problems, okay? And um, in in this book I'm writing for parents, one of the recommendations is um, our children are kind of geographically illiterate, okay? They can't understand things that are happening in the world because they're they don't understand the world. And so I think we've that in combination with history is going to help. How how would a child understand, or especially an older elementary student, understand why Crimea is such an important place? And why would Russia want Crimea? Mm -hmm. Okay. Just simple stuff. So at physical geography, cultural geography in, in terms with American history is something that is very, very important for elementary children. What is the constitution? Who wrote the Constitution? What does the Constitution say? You know, and so that's going to be uh, uh, something I think we're all going to have to address. Let's talk a little bit about diverse needs. Um, that's talked a lot about nowadays in higher education when it comes to facilitating learning, the pedagogy of the oppressed and so forth. Um, do you feel that people of different socioeconomic needs have different educational needs? Oh, I think so. But you know what? Um, there's a movie. It's an old movie. And, and I would encourage everybody to get a hold of this movie and just watch it. Is it, It's a movie about Marva Collins. Mm -hmm. And Marva Collins had a, uh, she was a disappointed public school educator and decided, hey, we're not doing the right things. We're going to start over and I'm going to start my own school. And she took all inner city black children and created some of the most incredible performance scene, period. It was unbelievable. And there was a movie written uh, or with, I think it was Cicely. Um, Cicely I forget. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was a great example of what can be done with absolutely no resources, but what we can do if we care about kids. And I think um, I think the problem we have today, I think, is the incredible number of illegal migrant children coming into schools, and we have to deal with them. And, and from what I've read, 100 plus countries, 100 plus different languages, but we have to deal with that when they get to school. And that's putting an incredible amount of pressure on our teachers, because they don't have to be, all they have to be is legal residents of the district to be able to receive a free and appropriate 
education. Okay. If they're a resident district, they get to now, how is the teacher going to deal with two or three different languages in, in schools? Uh, I in my book, I talk about a district that's right on the border. It's one of the best districts in this whole area. They're 99% Spanish speakers only, and they're 92% poverty level, but yet they are rated as the number one district in this part of the state. We need to look at what they're doing and, and try and emulate that in what changes we make in our schools for them to work. Yeah, absolutely. So they do have needs. They do have special needs, obviously. But I think I think we can deal. It's difficult, but we can deal with those needs if we approach it in a very basic fashion. Let's help those children learn English. Okay, let's make, that, let's make that a priority. And then from there, once they can master the English language, they can move on. Absolutely. Ever since I've been able to vote, every presidential candidate has talked about school choice and a voucher system where you'll have a choice to go to a parochial school with your taxpayer money or to a public school with your taxpayer money. And nothing ever happens to it. Maybe in a little districts here and there, there are experiments and so forth, but nothing has happened. What's your thought on school choice and parents having the right even to choose the school within their district that they feel might serve their child better? Well, I'm a major proponent of cho uh, choice. Uh, in, in our state here in Arizona, they have a real good charter school program. And nationwide, they're beginning to have charter school programs available almost everywhere. Statistically, charter school students are doing better than public school students. Now, my children, some of my children go to Catholic high schools. One, one particular student or grandchild came from a public school into a private Catholic school, high school. And he was failed miserably until he understood that, hey, I've got to perform. I've got to learn. I've got to work harder. And I've got, to, you know, and he met those expectations of the parochial school environment and has done a great job. But, you know, that that shouldn't happen. There should be a, in fact, I'll tell you what, uh, this is really controversial, but I kind of believe in competency testing. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in European, um, I have a son that's, a grandson that's studying neuroscience in Italy, okay? His final exam will be oral in front of a team of educators um, in Italian language. He has had to learn Italian. And he has to show them that he's competent as a neuroscientist, okay, mm -hmm. in order to get his degree. Um, and here's the amazing thing. His whole master's degree program was $2,500. Amazing. So a whole program. What is education in the, at the college level costing us now? You know, we, we see... At a mediocre college, it could be forty fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year. Oh, I, I see tenured instructors that maybe teach one class or two classes at the most, making $150,000, $60,000. Uh, we reach administrators at top universities making a million dollars. Absolutely. That, just, that, that was brought out when Claudine Gay was finally removed from her post at Harvard, that she went from her million dollar a year job as president of the university or whatever title she had to now being one of the deans making $995 thousand dollars a year exactly and there's something wrong with that especially considering the amount of money that they have in their alumni association their their foundation they could give every student a hundred thousand dollars a free education and they'd still be in good shape exactly or expand the university to they have a lot of candidates to choose from all are very very close uh, some have identical, um, you know, applications, actually. Expand the university, make it bigger, accommodate more people, educate people, uh, make the un make the uh, tuition less, you know, stop paying people a million dollars a year to be an administrator who's doing virtually nothing. We know what they do. They go to board meetings, uh, they sign a couple of papers and plagiarize a few others, and they're done, you know, so... Uh, mm -hmm. It's, it's a crazy time in education, particularly higher education. And I think that's the big problem with elementary education is that it's starting at the top. Teachers are not being trained properly. And hopefully your books 
put them on the right path of how to get back on the straight and narrow, the basics of education, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and getting parents involved, they're critical. The name of the book is American Elementary Education, The Longest Pandemic by Dr. Patrick Dalabetta. It's an amazing book. It's a comprehensive book. It will inform students, union heads, administrators, and most importantly, uh, parents on how they can have their children become better students. He's also written a wonderful children's book. It is called The Adventures of Thomas in Hopi Land. It is one of many books he has written, many books that are in the coming down the pike as well. And doctor, before we leave you today, I want to leave you with the last word. Well, I hope that um, we continue to move ahead in education. I'm glad that even though it, it I wish it weren't top down changes, top levels down. I, I am certainly optimistic that those changes are forthcoming. There are 32 states now that are forcing changes in education, the way we teach reading. And I think that's going to uh, cause things to move. However, a lot of administrators are still resistant. They still don't understand. And uh, uh, we need to make changes at those levels if we're ever going to change education. But I, I'm very hopeful that we are, are on the precipice of a change that is going to make education in America the best in the world, like it used to be. Exactly. Exactly. It's great to leave on that positive note that change is coming and that we are at the precipice of great change in elementary education and good things will be reaped by our students and by our society at large. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you, Logan. I appreciate your efforts to, uh, to send the message out. I appreciate your time, doctor. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford thanking you for your time, this time until next time on Spotlight.